Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another special edition of the show. So I'm hanging out here with Allison Soko Blosser and uh, at Soko Blosser Winery, and we're and, and the sun's coming out. So unfortunately, I didn't get any drone footage today. It, it sucks, but we're gonna come. I'm gonna come back Saturday, and we're gonna make another attempt. But um, so I'm hanging out here, and we've got a little tour. We're about to do some tasting. Uh, we've got little, kind of basically an iconic winery here, and I'm excited to uh, kind of dive into this. So, Allison, kind of introduce yourself, and then let's kind of tell the family story. Yeah, well, thanks, Mark. It's great to have you here, and sorry about the liquid organ sunshine that you're <laughs> experiencing. But it's hopefully, right. the sun will hopefully the sun will come out. That's what helps us be such an amazing place to right. grow Pinot Noir is because of that, that yeah. weather. So I'll give you a little bit of background about Sokol Blosser. So Sokol's my mother's family name and Blosser's my father's family name. Mm -hmm. They came here to the Dundee Hills and started with five acres of uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, Muller Turgau, Riesling, Pinot Blanc, uh, and they started in 1971. So back then the hillsides were just orchards and wheat fields and, and there was not a wine industry like there is now. Yeah. There were a handful of other folks like my parents who were trying to make a go of it and trying to see if, if uh, Oregon would be a great place to grow wine grapes. And so the whole group banded together and worked together and literally the whole industry would gather in our kitchen and our living room and share stories and um, experiences and how did you trellis and where did you find your cuttings and where's the next used equipment sale and once this group figured out how to grow the grapes and make wine uh, and we started making wine in, mm -hmm. in 77 then the challenge became how to sell it Okay. and how to market market Oregon and Willamette Valley wines. And so the, the group um, worked together to share and travel travel the, the United States and share the Oregon story and point out on the map, here's where Oregon is. It's just north of California <laughs> and south of Washington, and it's Willamette, right. you know, how, to, how to pronounce things. And slowly but surely, the Oregon industry was born. And now there's over 750 wineries in Oregon. You can find Oregon wines throughout the world and it's pretty amazing how far as an industry we've come yeah and for us as a family we've come pretty far as well starting from those five acres in 71 we now have um, about 120 acres 88 under vine mm -hmm. uh, we're fully into the second generation so my mom and dad who started the business retired in 2008 and my brother Alex and I took over the business together then so he's our winemaker oversees mm -hmm. the vineyards and then I manage the sales and the marketing efforts okay. so we're very much still family Family owned, family operated, and our whole goal is to continue to grow and be relevant so that we can keep the business in the family. That's and and I've already told you off camera, you know, the we don't have that tradition here in the United States, um, like you do in Europe. And I'm not saying that every European, you know, yeah. wine family like keeps it in the family. It'd be obviously like places like Bordeaux, they sell they sell everything off. But um, I, I just think it's great that you guys went ahead and decided to take that risk to 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 do that and I applaud you, absolutely applaud you doing that. Um, so we kind of started off and we kind of walked out, looked at some vineyards that were kind of behind me, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was some of your original blocks, right? Yep, yep. So we looked up at uh, the old vineyard block, which was the original planting. Mm -hmm. And right next to the old vineyard block is our big tree block. So we'll taste that site um, as well. Okay. And then right behind the uh, barrel cellar was our orchard block. So we'll also taste uh, wine made from that section cool. as well. And then uh, we went into what well, we saw kind of the, the the well, I guess the crush pad area, right? You know, yeah. but we went to little, the little cellar down you know, in like, our barrel cellar. Yeah. yeah. So right now it's kind of the end of harvest and things are quieting down. We have just a few fermenters left that we are waiting to drain and press. So all the Pinot Noir is going into barrel. We're mm -hmm. working on getting all the fermentations complete for um, all the white wines and our rosé. Okay. And so, you know, the, the harvest crew can see the light at the end of the tunnel. They can see that they might get a day off this weekend. <laughs> right. It's been a long six weeks. I bet. Yeah. 
yeah. grain and fruit. So is six weeks a, a fairly longer than normal, or at least more normal, longer than normal of recent memory, or is yeah. six weeks kind of like a typical harvest? There is no normal. Yeah, it's, okay. It's really, you know, every year is really challenging. Um, you know, we've done it probably as, in as short of span of like three weeks. Okay. Um, but now that we're making a lot more sparkling wine, harvest tends to start earlier. Okay. And, you know, it, then it's really ultimately just dependent on, on Mother Nature. And sometimes we'll start and then we'll have a week or two off and then we keep going. Um, but we just kind of, we had a few days off here and there from, right. from picking, but we still had a lot of activity going on. Right. So while we were walking around, you were telling me about the certification stuff that you that mm -hmm. you all do. So kind of cover that and, and what those really mean. Yeah. So it started out, um, we became certified organic in 2005 mm -hmm. in our vineyards. And we, you know, we really feel passionately about taking care of the earth because we are at the end of the day farmers mm -hmm. and we are very dependent on mother nature. We love growing Pinot Noir here in Oregon. We want to continue to grow Pinot Noir here in Oregon. And so what can we we do to be part of the solution rather than furthering the, the problems around the environment and, and climate change. Okay. And so we learned about um, B Corp certification and we became B Corp certified in 2015. And um, it's a very holistic look at sustainability, which takes into account the organic farming. We have a lead certified barrel seller. We use biodiesel in our tractors. We have solar panels. We take, you know, a very um, minimalist approach to packaging and trying to lessen uh, our footprint on, footprint on the earth from a packaging standpoint. Okay. So B Corp is looking at all those environmental aspects. They're also looking at social justice aspects, like how we treat our employees and the benefits we offer and how good of stewards we are in the community in terms of giving back. And then also the governance. Can we stay in business? Okay. And do we have good um, controls in place to allow for that? So I really like the approach that that B Corp offers, and we're very proud to be a certified B Corp. Very nice. Uh, what is what is lead certification for for, for the barrel seller? Yeah. yeah, so that's a green building designation that okay. the U.S. Green Building Council um, created, and we were the first in 2002 to uh, as a winery to go through that certification process for okay. a new building. Now there's a lot of lead certified buildings. It's much easier to obtain um, because so many more people are knowledgeable about it, and right. there's processes and systems them set up to be able to do that, uh, which is fantastic. All right. First, I'm just putting my phone on Do Not Disturb. Not that it really matters. And second, um, I just if there was there. I mean, I went to the website to like look up some stuff, and I just wanted to make sure there was nothing I was missing to ask. Um, which I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're good. Oh, that was the wrong. Oh, so yeah, we'll, we'll eventually get into these other stuff. Um, and and nothing, yeah. it's all from, it's all from your website. It's not like I'm not making an expose or anything like that. And it's our brand new website. It just yeah. launched a couple days cool. ago. Cool. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, we, we went in to the little winery part. We, you showed me, you showed me what a cross filtration filter was. That was yes. cool. So we're not going to get super technical, but, um, uh, so I, for those of you at, at home who are watching this, um, I listened to a podcast called Inside Winemaking. I think I mentioned it in, in, the, in the interviews yesterday. I don't remember. Um, but um, uh, actually, I think I did. So I got to see, they mentioned cross filtration, and I didn't know what it was because, like reading the chemistry book I read last year, so much of it goes over my head. Me and too. yeah, so I so we met, uh, who was the lady we met? Robin. Robin. Robin Holly, our um, associate so, winemaker. Um, got to ask her about about that, and I had the question of, so are they all the same size? And she's like, no, they're all the same. I mean, all the different sizes, no, they're the same. I'm like, why? Because it's a parallel filtration system. I'm like, that makes more sense, right? Because I was like, why would you like? But some, I don't know. I'm not a winemaker, <laughs> you know. But uh, so that was cool. I got to see one of those. I've never really seen one live. I may have. I just didn't know what to ask. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't know what questions to ask on that. Um, and so, like I say, you saw some stuff doing some filtration. I saw, uh, I saw an, an egg. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I forgot to ask you about that. So do you use that for anything specific? So it really depends on the timing of when fruit comes in. Okay. So we'll use it about three times, uh, to do three different ferments uh, okay. throughout harvest. And honestly, I'm not quite sure what they ended up putting in it this year. In the okay. past, I know we've done some sparkling base wine. We've done oh, okay. um, actually some Muller Turgau. We've done some Riesling. So it just kind of depends what comes in first that's that goes in and then okay what comes in when it 
when it's empty. Is it basically going to be something like a white wine that at least during those white wine? Yeah, yeah. that's going to be. An and official. it's it's okay. going to be a small part of whatever it's blended into because okay. it's a pretty small. Got it. Amount of yeah. juice that it can hold. Most most wineries they don't tend to have more than like one or two or maybe three eggs. It's a fun, yeah. expensive toy. Yeah. <laughs> does it make a difference? I don't know. It certainly looks very cool. Yeah. Um, you know, it, what little I know about those, they they, they definitely have, they definitely bring something to the wine. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's always cool to see those things. Um, I was like, it's an egg, but we were kind of distracted with those stuff, and I was like. But I think it was about the cross filtration. I think it was what we were distracted. You about. were very excited. To I was very that. excited about that one. What's that? Yeah. And we only use that right before bottling. Yeah. So we're, so, not, yeah. we're not using it now. That's why it was actually a coat hanger when, <laughs> when we were down there. <laughs> I promised Allison I was going to take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very expensive coat hanger. Since you brought it up, hanger. I didn't take a picture. It was, it was a very expensive coat hanger. Yeah. We're uh, tight on space during harvest, so right. everything kind of gets pushed aside and multi, multi uses. Yeah. One of, the, one of the places I was at yesterday, they actually have a formation tent. Oh, yeah. Like in the parking lot. Because, yeah. are you trying it to talk to me, Siri? <laughs> so much room. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, and uh, so yeah, the vineyards look awesome. I noticed um, on the drive up, uh, you have a neighbor, so you have Durant. Mm -hmm. And you sell is you sell something, but there's something in between vineyards. I, I well, so they have olive trees. Is that what? Because I looked yeah. like I thought I saw an olive so oil thing. So that is thing. their. Okay. Um, those are their olive trees. Okay. Yeah. All right. And they have an olive mill up at their Got it. All right. next to their tasting room. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I've remarked already on some of the other interviews that when driving around, you see so many orchards. Mm -hmm. I actually feel like there's more orchards than vineyards. I mean, I guess in certain pockets, there's more vineyards than orchards, obviously. I mean, here, there's lots of vineyards around. Mm -hmm. you, at least you can see them. Um, so, it, I mean, there's definitely still a lot of other farming that's going on. And I couldn't tell if they were olive trees or not I just could see something down there I'm like yeah oh, maybe olive trees maybe something else I don't know but, yeah. well you're also as you drive around are going to see a lot of hazelnuts yeah I've been, he I've been hearing so that, yeah. yeah so you're going to see a lot of lot of hazelnuts um, okay. as well so Oregon is the top producing hazelnut um, oh market. I didn't know that yes yeah, so okay we, we produce more hazelnuts than any other state all right I think we're second to turkey or something like that wow all like right that. Well, I mean, you know, you make one of my favorite liqueurs is made of, you know, Frangelico is made out of hazelnut. And so that's, that's really cool stuff. Nutella. I mean, Nutella, some yeah. pretty Nutella? tasty things coming yeah. out of hazelnuts. Exactly. Yeah. So shall we get into we some should, wine? Yeah. Especially before all the fruit flies <laughs> take over. It's part of so, a winery, right? Especially harvest. Part of harvest. Yeah. So I poured two white wines, our Willamette Valley Pinot Gris 2018 vintage and our um, Dundee Hill Chardonnay. These are both estate. Uh, we've got a... A vineyard that we lease and farm and have for a number of years in the Ole Amity Hills, okay. and so they with Pinot Gris and, and Pinot Noir. So part of this Pinot Gris is from our estate here in the Dundee Hills, and part of okay. it is from our estate vineyard in the Ole Amity Hills. That's why it's considered Willamette Valley. Pretty so, sure it's Pinot Gris and Chardonnay. Okay, good. It smells like it. This smells more like Chardonnay than anything else, and this smells more pretty much like a Pinot Gris. But sometimes Pinot Gris, when I do blind tasting, can taste like like a steel, you know, unoaked Chardonnay. Yep. It kind of just depends on how it's made. And we are definitely going for that steely, that minerality. We still want to maintain that that purity and that freshness of the fruit. So it's mm -hmm. all stainless steel fermentation, okay. both in those large stainless steel tanks that we saw, but also small stainless steel drums. Yeah. And uh, it's fermented completely dry. Okay. Because I'm getting more peach and apricot off of mm -hmm. this, which I don't typically get off of Chardonnay. So we're, we're just going to say this is Pinot Gris. And once I taste it, for you probably know by now. Um, but um, yeah. I had mine backwards. You had your backwards? Okay. Yeah, that's Pinot Gris. Um, so super tasty. Um, but I, I could see in a blind thinking that it might be like a Chablis mm -hmm. style or unoaked. Super lean. Yeah, but super lean, really high acid on there, um, really refreshing, um, just this real easy drinking, and uh, like, yeah, it's like refreshing is really the word that comes to mind more yeah. than else. And it's so amazing with you know shellfish, you know oysters on the half shell. Okay. Um, so trying to think about you know seafood that it goes really well with, um, salmon. Salmon's also fantastic with Pinot Noir. So Pinot Gris is just a really versatile. Yeah great food wine. Absolutely, yeah. It's good stuff here. Unfortunately, I just don't eat seafood. Okay, well, <laughs> then we'll find some other... Chicken. Chicken. Basically, basically yes. chicken's the substitute for anything seafood for sure. or pork. 
if you're trying to do like something more s meaty fish mm -hmm. like a salmon or a tuna. So we do a long, slow, cool fermentation with this, um, trying to get a bit of extended um, lees contact as well, because mm -hmm. we want a little bit a of weight. Yeah. yeah, a little bit more weight and, and uh, yeah. bigger in the in the mid palate, and greater mouthfeel. No, it's it's really it's really um, while it's a light wine, it's not like that. It's not like super like just crisp. It's not like Sauvignon Blanc style, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like ripping acidity. Um, so the lees contact helps like keep things in check and really kind of bronze it out yeah it's really nice yeah uh yeah so i might be going to a uh, a winemaker dinner um in carlton it's marshall davis okay they have their their uh, restaurant next door um horseradish mm -hmm. and i ate there the other day and it's a great um, spot. they sent me the menu and like I'm kind of a picky eater, so okay, I'm not sure if I'm going or not. Oh, I might no. drink the wines. I might. It's actually really reasonable. Go. It's really reasonable. It's like 95 bucks for six yeah, courses. It's actually go. really reasonable. Is it a lot of seafood? There's like, there's like one. There's like yeah. There's two seafood courses, and then there's one course that's that most of the ingredients I'm probably fine with. But then the rest of it's like I'll I'll totally eat those. Yeah. But yeah, there's like a caviar course, but it's like the bubble, so that's not like hors d'oerbs. Yeah, I'm sure so they I'll could just, make you I'll something just, without. No, I'll just drink the bubbles. Yeah. And there's like salad and there's like a seafood thing. I was like, uh. and that's always my 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 risk when I go to these dinners is there's usually a seafood course. Yeah. Because it pairs so well with wine. It does. And yeah. it's just delicious as well for those who like seafood. <laughs> so our 2017 estate, uh, Dundee Hill Chardonnay. So this is um we have a, a few, three acres of Chardonnay that we just planted on our estate property, um, but not yet bearing any fruit. And mm -hmm. so we've been leasing and farming uh, a vineyard on the other side of the Dundee Hills for a number of years called Thistle. Okay. And so they have Chardonnay uh, on that, like Got on that it. vineyard. So that's where we're getting this fruit. Okay. Um, smaller production, just you know, sold here in the tasting room. We do about uh, ten months of uh, fairly neutral oak. Yeah. There's there's a little bit. You know, it's, I think it's really more just um, the Chardonnay is really coming through. Um, but there's a little bit of the how, the how the oak, even though it's not like the oak flavors, it's more, I guess, the oxidation that happens. But yeah, I wouldn't mistake this for Pinot Gris for sure. Yeah. And the no, color, I know. It was easy to tell. And the color, and the color, the color is a alone bit like, tells you it's going to be Chardonnay. And that, I mean, the oak's going to give you a little bit of that, but it's more from the, more from the grape. Isn't it that... Um... What is the saying that the more the closer to cat pee the color, the better the Chardonnay or something like something ridiculous like that? I haven't heard that one. But, okay, but, well but there I'm you gonna, go. No, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that. The the, the closer the closer to that, it's more it's like likely it's Chardonnay. It's, uh, there's something like that. Okay. Yeah. I usually just think the golder it is. Yeah, golden. <laughs> the more cat golden pee, it is. That's. But yeah, I I can't wait to use that in tasting group. <laughs> Luckily, you don't record tasting group. Okay. <laughs> but I guess maybe you you'll get a chuckle out of that one. I bet you I will. I'll be like, I'm like, mm. I think this is probably your Chardonnay. It's like closer to cat pee. And they're gonna look at me and say, well, "That's what Allison said." <laughs> and they're just like, "Whatever, man." But no, this is like really nice. So um, my preferred style of Chardonnay yeah. is something like this, where it's either neutral oak. Or it's all stainless or Chablis style stainless steel, um, and I just I'm not saying that I I won't enjoy uh, a Chardonnay that has a lot of oak. I mean I will. I think it's just more my what my mental state is at that time or yeah. the situation I'm in. You know if I'm kind of like man I, that's what I want. You know I I do a Halloween episode every year and one of the wines well, I only had one wine. I had a, a liquor, I had a tequila wine and a cider. Uh, no mead. I'm sorry mead. First time I've ever done that one. And the, the, the cab was Napa cab, out in fruit, and it was big, bold, juicy, and probably not the normal style I would drink, but I totally crushed that wine and enjoyed it about three days later. And I was like, I'm going to drink this wine and enjoy it because that's what I felt like having that day, you know? There's a time and place for every style of wine, Pretty and much, it's yeah. really so much based on personal preference. For, for Alex, for me, for our family, our personal preference is having a much lighter hand mm -hmm. with the oak and being able to show off the fruit, still have a lot of great acidity, right. um, make it so that it's still a food wine. We like to eat. Yeah. 
you know, and I think, I mean, I, my personal preference with wines is basically the same idea. I mean, I tend to like older, uh, old world wines uh, more than new world wines. Mm -hmm. And while you can get a lot of oak usage, depending on what part of the world in Europe, part of Europe you're doing, you know, when you don't have a ton of oak on there, it's used just to enhance it or use as an aging vessel. Yep. I think it really, like you said, showcases the fruit. So now I'm pouring three Pinots. Okay. And so we'll get um, a nice overview of our vineyard here. Got it. And so this first one is our 2016 Estate Dundee Hills Pinot, which is a blend of everything grown on the red jewelry soil right okay. here on the hillside in the Dundee Hills. And then these next two are small lot bottlings from small sites within our estate vineyard. Okay. And since you brought it up, uh, can you describe what jewelry soil is? Yes. This is going to help everybody win trivial pursuit. So the um, Oregon is one of the few states that has a state soil, and the state soil of Oregon is jory, J-O-R-Y. Okay. And how is it, what's it comprised of? Because you actually, because I've already heard about it, but yeah. no one told me what it was. You so it's, told a, me what it it's was. a clay loam soil. Okay. It's red because it's volcanic. It's so old. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also incredibly deep. So it came from lava flows from the eastern part of the state, millions long long time ago okay. and it goes from about between the two and three hundred foot elevation mark all the way up to the top of the dundee hills it's okay. covered with this red jewelry soil and um it's sort of you know famous we call it the you know the red hills of dundee okay. it's this magic red dirt because it really truly is red it's not just this brown which i have seen brown dirt. <laughs> yeah. there's plenty of brown dirt out there yeah um and it's incredibly deep so it allows us uh, to dry farm most of our vineyard because it's so deep in, in most spots where the vines have a deep in our fruit system They're able to access the water and the soil throughout the year mm -hmm. and we don't need to have irrigation okay. So that's a another nice benefit of it. Yeah, very nice Yeah, we I forgot to bring that up in one of the other interviews because they told me that they dry farm But mm -hmm. they, I, they kind of forgot to bring that up. But yeah, yeah. that's cool um, because I mean that, I'm sure that also helps with your uh, Corp B and all that. Yes, it definitely helps with use. sustainability to not yeah. have to use quite as much water. Okay, for sure. and stresses the vines out a little bit more so they're not getting... Yes and no, because yeah. they're not that stressed because there's water in the soil. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just that you don't have to irrigate and... You know, they... We're not propping them up with the irrigation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so we're also certified organic in all of the in all the vineyards that we farm. Mm -hmm. So these all of these wines are made with organic grapes. Okay. And uh, okay. so this first one, 2016 Dundee Hills, and these are actually all 2016 vintage, which was just a really lovely vintage in Oregon, definitely on the warmer side of things, mm -hmm. um, but still produced. You know, what our style of Pinot is is that we're going for something that's really elegant, that's going to have nice balance between the brightness of the fruit and the toastiness of the oak and the acid, and then also what the soil imparts, which is this minerality and earthy okay. quality. And so we want balance between all of those aspects. We want this long lingering finish that really gives you something to think about. And then of course we want the wine to age well and pair well with food. Okay. So that's, that's what we're going for in Pinot Noir. And um, all these wines spent 16 months in French oak. So we're using, um, it's, it's about 30% new oak mm -hmm. um, on the Dundee Hills, slightly higher on the single blocks. Yeah. I like this. It's just just a really like nice level of fruit. It's you know it's not super fruity. Um, it's not um, it's not super earthy. Um, so in, in these, who watches this? You're gonna hear this is gonna broken record. This is my preferred style of Pinot Noir, is Oregon as a, as a category. Um, this is why I really needed to make sure I made the trip out here. I was, I think, I don't know if I told you, but I, no, I was tempted to go to Bordeaux in Spain, which my buddy is in right now, mm -hmm. but we didn't, we didn't, we weren't able to like make it work out the way I needed it to work out. So I was like, I'm going to Oregon anyway. Like, I know he tempted me, he, he really tempted me to come over there. But I was like, Oregon was my next destination. Um, and I've, I've already been to Bordeaux, but I haven't been everywhere, obviously, just like I haven't been everywhere here. So like multiple trips are necessary, but I don't know when I'm going to do that again. But yeah, this is my preferred style. I went to Burgundy two years ago and I, now I get it. 
I didn't really understand why people got all excited about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir from Burgundy. I get it now why, but my preferred style of Chardonnay is Chablis anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but this is how I like Pinot Noir is that good marriage between new and old world. Um, and you know, this, this is how I prefer it. So I like this. It's a really just good, just a good um, representation of, of what you're doing here. It's a very classic Soka Blosser, classic Oregon style. Mm -hmm. All right, and then remind me which one was this one? So this first one is our orchard block. So this okay. is right behind our barrel cellar okay. um, that we were looking at. And this is all 777 clone. Um, we have a number of different clones throughout throughout our vineyard. And so this particular one is 777. It's you know around three, 350 feet in elevation. Uh, and you know these again, these are all made the same way. Farming practices are identical. Um, vinification practices are the same. And then it just really comes down to showing off that specific site yeah. and how that specific site, you know, that's what the French call terroir and how that's really unique. And there's yeah. components, I mean, there's big tree and orchard that go into the Dendy Hills as well. Okay. So in some ways, it's kind of weird. At the beginning, it seemed a little earthier. And then I, I don't get into like mid palate and uh, finish, but it starts off a little earthier, but then it kind of finishes a little f more fruit forward. At least that was on my first sip. And the single blocks definitely um, also tend to have um, more ageability as well. We always say with the Dendy Hills, you know, five to, five to 10 years. Yeah. And with the single blocks, you know, definitely 10, maybe even up to 15 years as well. I almost coughed there. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it looked bad. I was like, no, the wine is really good. And it's like, I, I kind of coughed for some reason. I was like, oh, that oops. happens. That can yeah. happen. No, I like that. Yeah, I think in, in some ways the fruit seems to be a little more pronounced for me on this one. Um, it kind of starts off that little earthiness, but it kind of finishes a little mm -hmm. more a little more fruit. What's interesting about this last one, which is our big tree block, is mm -hmm. that this is the there's um, two sections of the vineyard, actually three section three three small sections of the vineyard that have irrigation because the soil is more shallow here. So whereas it's about ten feet deep throughout almost all of the vineyard, the big tree block, it's only about three feet deep. So we have the ability to do drip irrigation when and if needed there. Um, and so what we've noticed with the, this particular wine is that it's almost like this wine takes on broader shoulders. It's a little bit brawnier because yeah. the vines do struggle a little bit more because they don't have as deep of a root system. And we really try not to use the irrigation unless we absolutely have to. Um, so I think that, that that's usually, I should taste it first, but normally when I drink this wine, that's what I think of and that's, that's you know, reflected in the style of wine. Yeah, so I mean, it does. This, this seems to be a little bit of a of a um, broader. Um, uh, what's the word I want to use? <clears throat> um, I want to say bigger, but mm -hmm. more power, mm -hmm. more powerful um, wine. It definitely has a little more power to it, a little bit more grip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the fascinating thing. So this is. Um, you know, 450 to 500 feet elevation. Okay. And, you know, I pointed at them when we were outside. They're not that far apart. No. And yet it's a very different. Yeah. They're very different. Yeah. And that's, again, back to that whole concept of what the French called terroir. So, yeah, I mean, this is this has got a little more power to it. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of like a little marriage. I mean, I know they're not, in my head, this is kind of like an in-between this. This is more... Um, just a smooth, you know, more easy drinking. Mm -hmm. This has just a, a little bit touch more power, but the, the, I think the fruit comes through. And then this one has a little more power to it, but I feel like while well, it's still got the fruit, it's yeah. it's got a little more of the earthiness. I, I feel like I get like a, almost like a mint quality out of it. Um, not like a eucalyptus or anything like that, but just a, little, just a touch of mintiness. Yeah. Um, maybe like a mint chocolate cherry or something like that, you know? That sounds good. <laughs> you know, just sometimes I, I mean, everybody when they describe wine, sometimes they go into like certain like types of things. They they, they, they use um, specific like foods, like whether it's commercialized, whatever, you know, but yeah, like, so it's almost like a mint chocolate cherry on that. And, but the mint's like so slight, so subtle. It's really more the, the, the cherry mm -hmm. and then like a little bit of chocolate 
a little bit of mint on there, but yeah. yeah. No, I think those are great descriptions. And one thing that is pretty characteristic of Dundee Hills wines um, compared to other sub-appellations within the Willamette Valley is that red fruit characteristic. So mm -hmm. it's definitely more of the red cherry versus in like Yamhill Carlton, it's going to be a little bit more of that black. Okay. Black and blue yeah. fruit. Sorry, I was double fisting there for a second. Um, That's okay. But it's kind of cool. I, 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 first, I was going to go right down the line, but I was like, no, I wanted to kind of go on the ends to really kind of get that that really dramatic, um, get that differential there. Do you want some more of the Dundee Hills? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is kind of like a good in-between, um, just stylistically. Mm-hmm. Isn't wine fascinating? It's endless. Mm -hmm. And then every vintage is different. And I can say for myself, I mean, it's taken years for me to, like, if I had shown up here when I first started this podcast, I probably would, I'm like, I don't really taste the difference. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not, it's you not You have to train super, yourself. It's not super subtle, but it's still kind of subtle. Mm -hmm. um, like, my dad... He'd be like, it tastes all the same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and and, and I could show. There could be three different wineries in front of him, and it, it all tastes the same to him. So, um, uh, we went to, when we went to Napa. One of the only times that he ever like had some type of difference with a wine was with a food pairing, and um, we went to the, we had a, it was a tasting no interview. It was just tasting, and we did it. And um, the the person host had some like different food items. And which is one wine. They only make one wine there. And he's tasting it and he's like, Oh wow, it tastes tastes different. And then I then I told him how much I sold the wine for at my previous job. I don't say where I work, where I currently work. I forgot to say that, but a previous job, and he was like, whatever, man. Like he was like, I would never pay that. And I was like, it's really good wine, Dad, but that's restaurant pricing. Even at retail, it still was pretty, pretty high out there. But yeah, so he's he's I consider him more of my typical wine drinker. They like wine. Mm -hmm. They like they like what they yeah. like, but they necessarily are not going to be like, oh, I taste these subtle differences. And yeah, you have to you have to do it over time. You can't just. When my first wine reviews, I just I was really basic because that's what my palate was. Now I'm at least I can actually taste differences um, because it takes time. It takes time to, to do that. Yeah. It takes a lot of practice. Yeah, a lot of practice. It's endless. And this is one of the most fun industries to like learn and practice on because you get to enjoy alcohol, um, whether it's wine or any other type of alcoholic beverage. So, yeah, all three of these are really great. I like I like for what they are, you know, and what the expression you're you're, you're doing on these. It'd be hard for me to choose like a singular one. I probably would gravitate towards this one mm -hmm. um, on most days, but there'd be other days I would I would rather drink one of these other two. And I think it also depends not just on your mood and what you're mm -hmm. in the mood for, but also what you're eating. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna have a big juicy steak, maybe you do want the big tree. Yeah. So it kind of it also depends. Yeah, it does. On yeah. What's happening? It definitely does. Um, your whatever you're feeling, whatever you're eating. You know, definitely, there's there's some uh, differences in what you want to be drinking, and sometimes I'm not, I don't, I'm not even needing. I just want to drink some wine. This is this to me is the easiest one to drink on its own. Yeah, you just want to curl up with a book by the fire. Yeah, have some, have a glass of yeah. with you. Exactly. Awesome. Well, this has been really eye opening, and it's been really enjoyable. And I totally thank you for spending some time with me. My pleasure. Um, this was great harvest, fun. I know, is always a difficult time, so uh, I always appreciate when. Uh, when people at the winery can spend the two-ish hours or whatever <laughs> it, it is, because it takes a lot of time. I, I mean, even when it's not harvest, it's still appreciated. It's not like it's so easy that someone can give me that time. Um, but uh, I always appreciate that. You know, I do I have a cool job? Yeah, I do. I, I get treated really well and, and, and all that, and I really appreciate that. So, Well, we love visitors, so thanks yeah. so much for coming. And we are open every day in our tasting room here, and we love to have people come from near and far. So yeah. please come uh, come check us out. Absolutely. Anything else you want to say that we may not have covered? 
we pretty much covered everything. I think we got it. All all. right. Awesome. All right, everybody. So, uh, so you can click the links above and friend me up. I'll have links below, uh, for the winery. Um, and if I remember, maybe I'll like try to get like the lead and the court B stuff. If people want to like find more information about that. Mm -hmm. That means I probably watch the interview, which I, I always watch all interviews because I, I leave notes to myself. (laughs) I leave notes to myself. Plus I just cues to put pictures and videos when we, that's why I do that. Um, so yeah, check all that out and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.